welcome to the stage, Charlie Jane Anders. Hi. So lovely to be here. Thank you all. Um, I'm so thrilled. This has been such a wonderful day. Can I give another shout out to all the previous speakers who've been so great? Y'all have been so amazing. I've just been... I've been utterly blown away. Um, so a few years ago, I wrote this book, uh, Never Say You Can't Survive, about how to use creativity to get through really hard times. I wrote it in 2020, 2021, and I really believe that the act of telling stories, you know, creating imaginary friends, getting lost in the fictional worlds that you create, can really help you get through some really scary shit. And I'm here in one today because I, I'm in one piece in front of you because I spent the last few years doing some completely bizonctastic writing. I wrote a whole young adult trilogy about queer teenagers who fight space fascists and save the galaxy. As, uh, as you just heard, I cre helped to create Escapade, a trans superhero for Marvel Comics. And yeah, it was so much fun. And she's still out there. She's still doing stuff. It's so great. I know, I've just been goofing around. And so lately, whenever I sign books for people, I, I often write the same thing, which is daydreaming is important, serious work. Uh, which I think is, I really believe that. Um, and I usually add a silly, terrible cat picture. Um, my motto these days is that daydreaming is the opposite of doom scrolling. And so, yeah, I absolutely believe that creativity and just getting lost in your dreams and imaginary worlds can save us. But at the same time, nothing could have prepared me for the last few years. My books are banned in a handful of places. Uh, some people have it much worse than that. And trans healthcare and trans like life is illegal in way more places than that. And you know, it's just, you can't know what something like that feels like until it starts happening to you and your community. Like my words and my body are both outlawed by the same people, and I'm bombarded with like all this rhetoric about how my existence is dangerous. And seeing that image of a dumpster full of queer books in Florida, it just felt like a slow kick to the solar plexus. <sighs> um, so I am gonna talk about hope tonight. You've already heard a little bit about hope, but I'm gonna talk some more about what gives me hope. But first I have to talk a little bit about what takes hope away from me personally, and that is learned helplessness. Um, you know, the sense that there's nothing, Ed kind of talked about this a little bit, the sense that there's nothing we can do, when there's actually a lot we could do. Like when you talk about that trans moral panic that I mentioned and that Ed also talked about, you know, it would be just so easy for people to accept the widespread consensus among medical experts and trans people and everybody that trans kids deserve respect and support and healthcare. It would be so... <laughs> This should not be difficult. And yet you just get drowned out by this wave of pundits who are shouting nonsense and spreading fear-mongering narratives and they won't listen when we try to offer a correction or any real actual information. So it's easy to feel helpless even though we're not and even though we could easily just not be like that. So you've already heard a lot about community today, but I'm also gonna talk a lot about community. <laughs> and this, is, I, this was the trans march, I love that sign. Um, so, you know, when I say the community gives me hope for the future, I'm not just talking about all the stuff that community does, like mutual aid, sharing resources, sharing ideas, lifting each other up, creating spaces where people can thrive. Those are all essential functions that community f fulfills, and I love them, and I'm just, I'm all about those things. But another reason why I personally love community is because it helps us to build a consensus reality. And building a consensus reality is so important. People tend to dismiss this as filter bubbles. You've got some bubbles in your filter. Um, but it's actually, no, this is a powerful way of organizing and rallying and bringing people together. And you know, when I gather with other trans people, we share a consensus that trans people deserve respect and support, and we deserve to exist in the world. We deserve human rights. And over time, hopefully, we can spread that consensus to cis allies, and eventually it becomes like mainstream accepted, you know, normal stuff. Um, 
So this is basically like, I do two things in my life. I write shit, I write stories, comics, books, you know, articles, and I organize events like parties and literary things. And both of those things are kind of doing the same thing, which is that I am creating a version of reality that I want other people to live inside for a while. And I'm constantly aware that I don't do any of this on my own. Like as an author, I rely on beta readers, editors, sensitivity readers um, to help make my books better, but also anybody who reads one of my books is helping to create that book in their own brain. So it's a collaborative effort. Anytime you're telling a story, it's always collaborative. And of course, as an event organizer, I'm relying on everybody who shows up to one of my events to help make the event a thing. Um, and the process of creating a consensus reality is not functionally different from the process of imagining the future. Because anytime you are describing your vision of the present, you're also implicitly talking about the future you want to see and the future that you're scared of seeing. Um, so I want to say that communities are a crucial part of futurism, and futurism needs to center communities. So I've got four sort of quick principles for how to think about the future through a community-focused lens. Um, so first of all, community is made out of temporary stuff. And I think this is really important. Um, like XOXO, this is the last one, and it's, you know, new things come along. As I said before, I do two things. I organize events, and I write stuff. And I've published like half a dozen novels with a seventh on the way. I've published a bunch of short stories and comics and journalism. I helped to do this blog called io9. Um, and meanwhile, I organize events. Like every month in San Francisco, I do an event called the Trans Nerd Meetup, which is just what it sounds like. It's a gathering for anybody who self-identifies as gender non-conforming and likes to geek out about stuff. And I helped to run the Bookstore and Chocolate Crawl, which is a, it's like a few times a year. We get about 100 people together, and we just march through a neighborhood, visiting all the bookstores, buying as many books as we can carry. And in between bookstores, we eat chocolate. And it's a very chill thing. I also have organized for many years a literary event called Writers with Drinks, where I make up silly fictional bios for the authors, and I try to mash up as many genres as I possibly can in one event. Um, and in the past, I've organized events like this, the Ballerina Pie Fight, which is just what it sounds like. It's a, a dozen ballerinas just throwing pies at each other. And so I trace my evolution as a writer and as a queerdo, all the scenes I've gotten to belong to. I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in 1999, and I got to join the Cacophony Society for a little bit. I got to be part of a nationally distributed bisexual magazine called Anything That Moves. I was part... <laughs> it was... It was a wonderful magazine. We published anything that moves us. And it was like, it was a beautiful magazine. I've, and you know, I've, as a queer writer, I got to be part of a, like a queer literary scene in the early 2000s that meant a lot to me along some, alongside some absolute freaking legends. And you know, all of these things disappeared. They popped like bubbles, like they're just, they're gone. But I remember them and new things keep coming along. And you know, part of what I've been thinking about lately is, we think that books and writing are permanent. Whereas like you throw an event, you have a shindig, it's over the next day, it sort of fades into memory. But a book is gonna live forever, right? Not really, books also fade from memory. They just get harder to find, they disappear, and that's a really, really good thing. So this is Doris Lessing. She's probably my favorite writer. And this is when she won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2007. She's bringing her groceries home from the grocery store. There's a bunch of reporters. A, you can watch this video on YouTube. There's a bunch of reporters outside her house. And she, they're like, you won the Nobel Prize. And she's like, that doesn't help me get my groceries inside. Why are you guys blocking my door? She's just very cranky. It's very funny. <laughs> so she, she won. I love her so much. And her writing's amazing. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2007. She died in 2013. And I was speaking to a group of librarians in 2017, only a few years after she died, and I mentioned her, and I just looked around the room and realized nobody knew who she was. 
just like room full of blank stares. And you know, um, when I was coming up in science fiction in the late 90s, people were like, these are the science fiction and fantasy writers you need to read to understand the genre, and if you don't read them, you're not legit, and blah, blah, blah. And like, most of those people nobody talks about anymore. They're not in the conversation anymore. People still read them, but they're not kind of front and center anymore because we have new leading lights, and that's a really good thing. Um, a couple weeks ago, Emily Tesh won the Hugo Award for Best Novel for her incredible book, Some Desperate Glory. And I was really struck that the first line of her speech was, I hope this book is forgotten. You can watch that speech online. I highly recommend it. And like knowing that your art is not going to burn bright forever kind of gives you permission to make, make something that speaks to a particular moment. And that makes it more community focused, I believe. You can create art that is foolish and strange, which is another way of saying you can create art. Um, <laughs> I don't want to speak to people 100 years from now. I don't fucking know those people. I want to speak to people now. Um, Some Desperate Glory by Emily Tesh is a perfect example. It's art that's like brazenly political, defiantly odd, very much of this moment. Same with The Saint of Bright Doors by Vajra Chandrasekhara, which has been sweeping the genre awards. I can't believe that like everything, everywhere, all at once is, was such a huge mainstream hit. You know, I just want to say, what is progress if not finding new stories to tell? So, and of course, I do always want to honor and respect the people who came before. Shout out to Miss Major. Shout out to Sylvia, P. Uh, Sylvia Rivera. Shout out to Martha P. Johnson. Uh, but when I think about using creativity to help build a better future, I think in terms of the here and now and speaking to my community right now. So, it's a weird kind of paradox. The, the less you think about posterity, the more you can create something that actually helps to shape the future. And, you know, I can't trust anybody who's too desperate to be taken seriously, which brings me to point number two. So... <laughs> stare into the face of Cumberbatch. Um, so, you know, you know, you all know the great man theory of history, right? that there's a great man and he, he's what shaped history. So the counterpart to that is this idea that there's a great man who's going to lead us forward into the future. And some of the hungriest bottom feeders in the world have seized on this archetype of the smartest man in the room, as evidenced by Sherlock, but also House, you know, Tony Stark, certain versions of Doctor Who. And I prefer a future where everybody has good ideas to one where all the ideas get handed down by one fancy bitch. I just do, you know? And, you know, I feel like other people have talked about this today, but I feel like in my creative life, I've seen over and over again, that there's often one person who gets credit for, like, inventing something or pioneering something, whereas there was really a whole scene around them that all came up with it together, and this one person just kind of got the credit. Um, so, you know, being part of a community means listening and learning from each other. And the, the toxic thing about the, the lone genius guy is that he can never be wrong. And I fucking love being proved wrong. It was one of the best things about being a blogger. People told me I was wrong all the time, and a lot of the time they were right and I was wrong, and I learned stuff from them. I've never been happier than when somebody takes the time to explain to me why I'm full of shit. And, you know, they're, they're taking their valuable time to do that. It's a great service. I really appreciate it. Being proved wrong fills me with hope because it means that there's stuff I don't know, which in turn means that despair is premature. The people who are banning books right now want certainty. They want things to make sense according to their own limited worldview. They hate being wrong. And there's no accident that there's a lot of overlap between the book banners and the people who want to automate creativity using fake AI. The creative process is full of trial and uncertainty and error and being in dialogue with other artists. And it's basically antithetical to certainty and authority. So these are the stickers I've been handing out. If you don't have one, I can give one to you. I have a novel coming out next year called Lessons in Magic and Disaster. And the main character is a graduate student who's studying this like 
mysterious queer novel from the 18th century. And there's a lot in there about how like the institutions that make sense of the world, journalism, academia, art, are being sort of chipped away at. And how the most important things to talk about are the hardest things to talk about. But we need to talk about them. We need poets, we need artists, and shout out to all the journalists and ex-journalists in the room. And you know, all of these things, like Ed was saying, they're all communal pursuits where one person draws on the work of others. So, you know, and we also need to keep expanding the circle and bringing more people into the community. That's rule number three. I feel like whether, is your community growing? Is it becoming more inclusive? That's the single best metric for the health of a community. Welcoming more people means that you get aspect, you get access to more ways of thinking about stuff, which means that you get better ideas. And, you know, as an organizer of events, like this is from Writers with Drinks, I think, I think a lot about how to make people with vastly different experiences feel at home in my events. So, like, you know, I've been in a lot of trans spaces that imploded because somebody decided that certain people were not trans enough or they were the wrong kind of trans. And that, especially for a community that is already, like, marginalized and under attack, that's just really toxic and unacceptable. So whenever I publicize the Trans Nerd Meetup, I make it very clear that if you think you belong at this event, you do. There's no policing. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've been so happy to see like non-binary people, bi-gender people, agender people, gender fluid people, you know, gender queers coming under our umbrella. And there's still so much work to be done to center trans people of color more in our community. That's something that, that we barely even, we need to do so much more with that, um, on that. Um, and as a writer, I increasingly think about how to represent people in my stories who have been left out too often from our stories until now. When I was a kid, there were trans bodies in media, but openly trans creators were not part of making it. Um, a friend of mine a while ago did a deep dive into the weirdly huge canon of like 1980s media that makes fun of trans people. Like, I had somehow forgotten that Crocodile Dundee assaults a trans woman, and it's played for laughs. It's like, ha, 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 oh, gosh. Things have gotten a bit better in mainstream media, but there's this massive backlash now, which is having some effect, and we're reminded over and over again that our communities have to be the ones to support and uplift our stories because we can't count on the mainstream to do it for us. So my hopeful visions of the future are all about dreaming up queer enclaves that thrive in the face of climate change and other disasters. I like writing about the people on the margins who take in strays and about building alliances with other people who are fighting for liberation. Sometimes expanding a community is a painful process. You have to let go of some of your ideas about who belongs and who matters. Sometimes you have to kick out a few people whose behavior stands in the way of greater inclusion, and that, that really sucks too. Um, but those are growing pains. And you know, it shouldn't be all pain. There should be joy, yeah? There should be joy. So I want to close by talking about joy and friendliness and kindness. Communities need fun. And, and constructive weirdness. And I really can't get into a story where nobody ever has a good time, where there's just no good vibes and people being there for each other. It's easy during a horrible, scary moment to see fun as like unrealistic or bet a betrayal, to see sweetness as somehow like that's not real. But it's the unrelenting grimness that's, that's, that's unrealistic and pointless. I get bored. I get burned out. This is why I'm spending my time on Tumblr looking at Owl House fan art instead of getting sucked into arguments. <laughs> I love Tumblr. I was talking to folks about this yesterday. Um, instead of spending my time on zombie Twitter getting sucked into pointless arguments. You know, laughter gives us the strength to face up to endless horrors. As a writer, my favorite scenes to write are always the, the small kind of intimate moments where my characters get to have fun and dance and party and reconnect before they have to go off and fight the monsters or whatever. 
And in my party planning, in my writing, in everything I do, I want to bring people into spaces where they recognize that nothing makes sense. It is all bullshit. And most of the things that people hold true are absurd. And that means that we can have a pillow fight and sing 1960s ad jingles at the top of our lungs. Silliness will set us free. Ridiculousness, ridiculousness promotes social cohesion. It brings people together because laughing together makes me feel closer to everybody else. And it pisses off the haters, which is a really good bonus. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to end by talking about kindness because I feel like kindness is more important than ever. It's really indispensable at a time when so many people are hurting. Last weekend, I went to the drag Star Trek show in San Francisco. That's drag kings playing Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock, and that's some amazing person playing a rogue shuttlecraft. Um, it was it was beautiful. If you ever get a chance to see it, you should. So. Human connection is what it's all about. It's the reason we're alive. It's the reason we're here. And it's what's going to sh save us from all the shit canos that are, gonna, that are pouring molten shit down on our heads. Um, connecting with other people is really pleasurable, even though it's also really hard. And it, it is the thing that gives me hope for the future. Human connection, fundamentally, is the thing that makes me believe that we can survive. Um, so I'm here for gentle absurdity, and tender weirdness. And I just don't trust any version of the future where we don't party and goof off and act ridiculous and rejoice and just rejoice together. So my final thought, I don't believe in utopias. I don't believe in dystopias. What I do believe in is people taking care of each other. So please take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you.